here to dive deeper into the Senate and talk about a new book he's edited celebrating the late George Cardinal Pell. Pell Contramundum is the president emeritus of the Acton Institute, Father Robert Sirico. He joins us from Rome. Father, thank you for being here. Before we get to the book, I want to get your take on a few other happenings around the Senate. Two bishops from China left the assembly earlier than scheduled this week yes. due to what was billed as pastoral concerns in the home diocese. Pope Francis appointed them to the Synod himself. They were chosen, of course, from a pre-approved list by the Chinese Communist government. This premature exit was similar to the one that occurred at a Synod gathering in Rome back in 2018, exactly. shortly after the consummation of that infamous Vatican-China agreement. What is the message being sent here in your estimation? Evidently, the message is that the uh the Chinese Communist government doesn't think this is important enough for them to have people here for too long a period of time. Uh, you remember that when Cardinal Zen came for the funeral of Pope Benedict, he was allowed five, hour, five days. So he arrived, went directly from the airport to the funeral, uh, the next day met with the Pope, and then went back to the airport and got back to China. So uh, I think it's a, a slight well, it also might indicate uh, something about the nature of the secret terms of that agreement with Rome. It, it, it feels like it's a who's the boss kind of game being played here. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, talk about secrecy. I mean, the whole <laughs> the whole discussion at the Senate is is very complex, uh, the whole method and the way in which they do it. And then they keep tapping down on uh, people. Uh, not being open and speaking uh, their hearts and their mm -hmm. minds. Yeah, no, it's an amazing, uh, you know, confluence of influences as well as uh, suppression of some information and then, uh, you know, overexposure of others. Father, I spoke with Robert Royal about this earlier. Right. The idea of priorities. Pope Francis has refused to meet with key cardinals, including Cardinal Zen. Uh, I know reporters who've requested interviews as well with the pope, all of which he's refused. Contrast that with the lengthy meeting he had this week with dissident Catholic nun, Sister Janine Gramick of New Ways Ministries, and even Hollywood star Whoopi Goldberg, yes. who uh, told him she's taking nuns into the 21st century. Father Sirico, your take on these choices right. the pope makes with his time and given your knowledge of media and business, how damaging is this to the optics of the papacy as well as in the midst of this synod? Well, of course, from my perspective, it's damaging. I'm sure from another perspective, this is exactly what the Holy Father wants to project, that he's sending a message without saying anything, without making an argument, just by the selection of the people he chooses to meet with, and generally the people who are giving uh, meditations and reflections during the course of the uh, Synod. So this mm -hmm. is very mm -hmm. well calibrated, really. What do you think that message is? What do you think he's trying to convey without saying? I, I think he's trying to say the church is on the move. <laughs> the question is, and, and he, he really developed this thought recently in one interview where he talked about uh, the church has to change. It has to go forward. Yeah. And it needs to leave behind certain things. And the, the problem is that we don't have the kind of boundaries and the safeguards in place as to what is it that's going to change. I mean, can, can the church... Uh, create the idea of a fourth person of the Blessed Trinity? I mean, I, I'm sure the Holy Father is going to say no to that, but what are the criteria? How, how do you know, how do you discern mm -hmm. an authentic development from an aberration? Right. Yeah. And Cardinal Newman and others have been very clear on what the pattern of that development would look like. This doesn't seem to satisfy it. But anyway, uh, I need to get your thoughts on your friend, Chinese Catholic freedom fighter Jimmy Lai. Jimmy's been a prisoner, of course, viewers of this yes. show know, a prisoner of the Chinese Communist government for over a thousand days now, reaching that milestone at the end of September. Yes. Lai is now 75 years old. Father, you produced this fantastic documentary, The Hong Konger, about Jimmy Lai. How is he doing, and do you see him ever being released at this point? As a matter of fact, we just had a premiere of the Hong Konger here in Rome to a packed house, including about, um, I, I suppose there were eight 
uh, ambassadors who were present, a uh, good bit of media, and the people were really moved by this. Um, the sad thing is, now they've moved his trial. It was a, supposed to take place right about now in October, but they moved the trial to December. And if I'm not mistaken, it's the 18th of December. And uh, you ask me if I think he'll ever be out. Um, I pray so. I've been working very hard to raise the awareness of his struggle and encouraging people to uh, call to free Jimmy Lai. Uh, but it, it doesn't look very good. I, I think uh, if we hear that he is extradited to mainland China, I think that, that says everything that will be said on the subject. Well, Father, given the Vatican-China agreement, how does Jimmy Lai's witness contrast with the Vatican's seemingly permissive attitude toward this dictatorship in China? Well, I, you know, it, it's a stark contrast, isn't it? And it's not just the dictatorship in China. I mean, you have uh, just today, uh, I think it was 12 priests who were released from Nicaraguan uh, prisons uh, and exiled to Rome. The bishop who was arrested is, is elected to stay uh, in Nicaragua. Mm. Uh, there's relative silence about that. I haven't heard any press uh, yep. coverage or any Vatican statements on that. So we see this as a pattern. The The thing is that Jimmy Lai is giving witness. He's a white martyr. In fact, in the book, which we'll talk about in a moment, Cardinal Gracias yeah. from... Uh, uh, Bombay, uh, who described uh, referred to Cardinal Pell that way. George Cardinal Pell is a white martyr, and I think that Jimmy Lai is a white martyr as well. Yeah, yeah, you're getting ahead of me, Father. But let's move on to the book. Uh, you edited this new book that celebrates the thought okay. of the late George Cardinal Pell, Pell contra mundum, Pell against the world. In it, you highlight Cardinal Pell's role as a defender of orthodoxy in chaotic and confusing times. I mean, he certainly was a prophet. Uh, I spoke with him on the show in June of 2021, and I asked Cardinal Pell then about the German synodal way, but not even he could imagine that the aberrations in the German church would soon be embraced by the global synod in Rome as well. Watch this. I don't know whether abortion and euthanasia are on the books. Uh, I hope not, but uh, certainly they want to change the teaching on, uh, some do, on sexual morality by blessing homosexual unions. Uh, they object to the tough teachings of Jesus on uh, adultery and against remarriage. Uh, they seem to have a different list of uh, qualities that are necessary for the fruitful reception of the sacraments, different from that of St. Paul. And some of them would uh, want to have an order of w women priests. Now, uh, we can't have a German set of the Ten Commandments, and we uh, can't have a, uh, a set of uh, women priests in Germany and nowhere, nowhere else. Father, your reaction to that, particularly that line, they want to change church teaching, it's really haunting. Yeah, it, it's so good to hear his voice. And isn't it remarkable that uh, you said that was in June? And here, it could be the the front page of the news today because now it's moved not just from Germany, it's moved from Germany to the Universal Church because this is exactly the kind right. of thing with great ambiguity, too. Because at the beginning, they said, no, we're not here to change church teaching. But now, as we've gone through two and almost three weeks of the Synod, we see this coming to the fore that we're led Laying the foundations, one cardinal said, for the changes that will take place and will address those concrete changes, he said, next year. Because remember that the Senate is in two parts, so there'll be in 2024, there'll be another part of it. But that's exactly why I edited this book. I was with the cardinal, um, you know, quite a bit just before he died. And um, these were the concerns that were uh, on his mind that he wrote about. In fact, uh, the essay that he wrote for the London Spectator is the uh, lead uh, article in this uh, book. Yeah. And, and Father, talk, talk for a moment about the significance of that Latin title, Pell Contra Mundum. Um, I mean, you include three addresses here by Cardinal of course, Pell, all given in the last six months of his life. But go ahead, tell me about the title. Why yes. that? Yes. 
Well, of course, Pell Contramundum is a play on the Athanasius Contramundum, because remember that Athanasius um, was very concerned at the Council of Nicaea when the whole world, Jerome said, the whole world woke up and found itself Arian. So this, the Arian heresy was the denial of the deity of Jesus Christ, a very core fundamental part of the church's deposit of revelation. And, and, um, Athanasius fought against that uh, under very difficult circumstances. He was exiled twice, and the phrase emerged, Athanasius contramundum. So I saw that this was exactly the role that Pell was playing, and I wanted to ensure that his voice would still be heard mm. at this synod, which is why this book is published in four languages and has been distributed to every cardinal throughout the world. You contributed your own essay to the book, as did George Weigel and the Archbishop of Bombay, Cardinal uh, Gracia, yes. as you mentioned him earlier. And uh, in that essay by Cardinal Gracia, titled George Pell, White Martyr, um, he goes into some of the uh, really delicate and, and heartbreaking details of the time Pell spent in prison in Australia for crimes he didn't commit, and how that shaped the man he yes. would become in his final years of his life. Reflect on that essay, if you would. Uh, well, he pointed out the 404 days were like a retreat for Pell. That's what Pell said. And it produced these three volumes of very uh, rich spiritual reflections uh, on his time in prison. And what you see there in, in yeah, a very mundane reflection, uh, uh, on his time there and uh, his attachment to the truth of Jesus Christ. Um, so uh, I think it's a very powerful witness in that he comes out without rancor, without hatred uh, and uh, toward anyone. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, he's a great model in that Cardinal Gracious, who knew the man well and didn't always agree with him, uh, acknowledges mm -hmm. that. Yeah. In your essay, Father, you write uh, the essential question Pell labored to raise in his last days comes down to this. Does the church exist by virtue of a divine mandate, a deposit of faith entrusted to the apostles intended from the beginning to be handed down faithfully from one generation to another intact? Father, up until now, it seems that Cardinal Pell and we in the church would count on that continuity and could. What do you think is the answer to that question today, now, as this synod closes? Well, the, the, this is what we all pledge. This is what we pledge in our, our baptismal uh, promises at Easter. We pledge it in our priestly ordinations. This is the fundamental of the faith. And this is being explicitly negotiated away in the name of modern research and openness and walking with people. Now, we want to be open to people. We want uh, to walk with people who are hurt. We want to embrace those who are on the margins. It's not a question of whether we love people or don't love people. It's a, it's a question of whether we uh, propose to them the truth of Jesus Christ. And the truth of Jesus Christ is stable. It's dependable. And it is unalterable. And it can be developed and applied in different circumstances, of course. But we have to have that uh, continuity of teaching and the safeguards around that. Which, And in that essay, I also draw the connection to Newman. Because uh, in many ways, Pell was like a Newman. He, uh, he was not afraid to engage the issues of his day. He was in court. Uh, Newman was in court. Uh, he um, wrote himself into the Catholic Church precisely on this point of the development of Christian doctrine. How does it authentically mm. develop? How does it go from the implicit to the explicit? Not a change or a reversal of its teaching and its insight, but an amplification and a clarification of the truths of the faith. That's what Newman mm. was about mm. That's precisely what Pell was about. And Newman, you'll remember, was called the silent father of the Second Vatican Council. My mm -hmm. effort is to ensure that Pell's voice is here, that he is here as a silent father of this synod. 
Before we go, you include an essay written by Cardinal Pell right before he passed. It was published posthumously. It was titled, The Catholic Church Must Free Itself from This Toxic Nightmare, referencing the Synod. It includes the ominous warning to his brother bishops, yes. quote, the synods have to choose whether they are servants and defenders of the apostolic tradition on faith and morals or whether their discernment compels them to assert a sovereignty over Catholic teaching. So far, the synodal way has neglected, indeed downgraded, the transcendent covered up the centrality of Christ with appeals to the Holy Spirit and encouraged resentment, especially among the participants. Father Sirico, the first portion of this Synod on Synodality is wrapping up next week. How prophetic are those words, and what do you want readers to take from this Pell Contra Mundum, this book? Uh, astoundingly prophetic. I mean, he he nails it completely. Remember, he died uh, in, in January. There's almost a year. And he nailed the thing precisely. And this is a call to bishops to be bishops, to be another Athanasius, to stand against the trends. And uh, I think this is what's up for grabs. You know, it's they're, they're not really even having any theological debates. And that's not an accusation on my part. That's that's their self-definition of what's going on here. By them, I mean the organizers. I think there's mm -hmm. a subterranean concern I have heard. I've met with many bishops over the time that I've been here in Rome. And there is concern. They're trying to be prudent and certainly respectful of the office of the Holy Father. But... Um, We'll see what happens in the next few days. I, I, I know that there's tension in certain places. Yeah. Well, we'll see how all this shakes out. And again, this is the greatest uh, cliffhanger ever because you've got to wait a full year for anything to happen. So we will leave it there. Pel Contra Mundum, edited by Father Robert Sirico, is available now at bookstores everywhere and online. Father, thank you for being here. Good to be with you, Raymond.